Welcome to Always Analog, where we celebrate the beauty of analog technology in the digital world. So today we're going to do uh, a little typewriter review. I'm going to take a little tour of the typewriter I have in this box here. Um, a Remington Quiet Writer from 1957. Uh, that is according to the good folks at the typewriter database, um, according to the serial number of this machine. And we'll take a look here. So here it is. The Remington typewriter, it's in this sort of uh, squarish rectangular case. Um, the case isn't in bad shape, uh, actually. It's, um, uh, you can see it's kind of got a nice heavy duty uh, vinyl um, coating around it and a nicely really stitched uh, corner molding. Um, around the edge and then on the inside you've got sort of this this green felt and it sits in it uh, and and these were really popular typewriters at the time you know these and the, the Smith Corona 5 series um, were really good sellers uh, for the dealers uh, during the late 50s they sold a lot of these typewriters and I still see them frequently um, and they this is really a standard issue uh, they had these wonderful green keys and then they have this um, and the light might be throwing the color off a little bit but it's really a non glare um, sort of grayish brown is how I would best describe it. Uh, Remington Quiet Writer. Um, and I will get it out of the case and take a closer look. But this is, again, this was a very common portable typewriter uh, of its period. And uh, Remington sold a lot of these in the United States. Uh, and um, you know what? They're kind of a fun uh, typewriter. Um, uh, there's some debate as to whether or not they type as well as uh, the Smith Corona uh, from the same period. But um, if you had one of these in the late 50s, um, that was pretty good uh, to have a Remington Quiet Writer. And uh, it'll be better. Once, let me get this out so we can take a little bit better of a look at the styling and the shape and the features of this Remington Quiet Writer from 1957. I've got it out of the case, but just here's a quick look at how uh, the typewriter sits in the case. There are these two brackets at the back, which actually sort of uh, hook under uh, the machine. Uh, and into a part of the machine's frame. And then there are these two spring-loaded clips on the front which snap into uh, the ma uh, machine's bottom part of its frame. And that holds it securely on this bottom base. And the cover is designed in such a way I'm doing this one-handed, so um, that you can actually take the top part of the cover off and have the machine just, you can just keep it on this base uh, if you like and use it that way. So um, a versatile base and, and fairly, uh, sometimes it's a little tricky to get these back uh, clips um, in the right spot on the frame, but but it does work very well in terms of holding the machine uh, very securely um, while it's fastened inside the case. So here's the Remington Quiet Writer, uh, completely freed of its case, and we can take a closer look at this machine. Um, again, it's in this very uh, matte, dulled, gray metal, uh, grayish brown paint job. 
And they really did that for a reason because, you know, even I've got a bright light on this machine and what you're not getting is a lot of glare off of it. So most typewriters never really featured glossy paint. It wasn't something because it was uh, distracting to the eyes, especially in an office environment where you might have a light overhead, uh, a desk lamp, something like that, or even overhead lights reflecting back. I mean, even here we've got two typewriters on the table on either side. There's a uh, Smith Corona a standard. You can see that is in a, a brown matte paint job. Uh, and I've got an Olympia SG-1 over here in sort of a greenish-gray matte paint job. Um, so that's just how typewriter manufacturers did it, and it was all about reducing glare and eye irritation. So, standard keyboard here. This one actually, I'll come in a little closer, uh, if we see... It does feature an exclamation point over the one. And again, it really has, I think they're really, I love the color of those green keys. Uh, so it has a, a full-size keyboard and a nice long space bar. And then we've got some other controls here. This one here is your ribbon reverse. So this will change the direction that the ribbon spool is going in. And then over here, let me lift whoop, let me lift this up so that you can see it. Uh, is the color selector for your ribbon. So black, white or stencil and red. It's actually a blue dot in there. Um, let me, I guess, uh, so blue, white, red. I only have a, uh, I have a solid black ribbon in the machine right now, so, <clears throat> but um, it did have the ability to cut stencils if necessary, and if you had a bicolor ribbon, then you could use that as well. So, Remington Quiet Writer on the front. Let me pull back here and we can get a, a better look at the really the the shape of this typewriter. Um, bring it down a little bit. This was sort of the the next generation of Remington Portable uh, coming off of after the Second World War ended, um, there was one that came out in 48, 49 called the Remington All New. And uh, they ran with that for a few years. And then this was sort of the next body style. And it's interesting, you have sort of this, it's almost like a, a two-piece. Um, you know, you have where the keyboard um, comes out here, and then you sort of have this bulbous, rounded kind of front part of the typewriter. Um, but it really does make for a really nice profile, I think, of the machine. I, I always liked the shape of these. I thought they were kind of cool. Um, here on the back... Let me let me come down a little bit so we can kind of get get on that. So here we have Remington Rand, patented in U.S. and foreign countries, made in the U.S.A. And that's a decal. Here's the other side. You can and then we'll come around. It's nice. It has this nice um, not quite chrome. It's sort of a again, they wouldn't nothing too shiny, but but uh, 
sort of a brushed stainless steel band around the bottom edge of the front cover. So speaking of, let's, uh, let's open the hood here and take a little look inside this machine. This is a Pica typeface. Um, so 10 characters per inch. And under the you know, they call it quiet, and I love how these typewriter companies, you know, thought, oh, we're going to make a quiet typewriter. A quiet typewriter is sort of an oxymoron, I think. But you can see that there is a, um, a, a brown a felt padding uh, under the hood here, um, which, of course, you know, just glued on and um, with the intent that it would reduce some of the noise um, uh, of the impact. It's not an overly loud typewriter, I will say, but it, it, I wouldn't call it whisper quiet or anything. Um, and then you have a, a rubber um, re where, the, where the hammers come back down here, um, they hit a, a, a rubber coated rest so again to reduce the noise uh, that this machine makes in typing um, and it I think it probably does somewhat um, and uh, surprisingly this rubber on here is still fairly pliable so again here is our um, this is our, our ribbon reverse here and then this is our a ribbon color selector here on this side. The word Remington on the front is raised uh, and that is um, a, a, a plaque that's on there and then you have the decal quiet writer there. Uh, one thing about this machine uh, with regards to its margins. You can see how they work. They are set up on the back, which is a nice feature. They're very handy. Um, and the bell here <laughs> just kind of is a thunk. I got to look at that and see if, um, if I can make it more of a ding. I don't know if that, that's possible, but I've noticed the same sound on one of my other uh, quiet writers of this era. But yeah, it has, uh, you know, it has your margin selector here, of course your paper bale, and they touted uh, a setup called Miracle Tab. And that's really to be noted here. Uh, and this is a, a one control tab set. So rather than a button to depress to set the tab, what Remington did is they devised a system by which you can use this lever, pushing it up will set the tab, pushing it down will clear the tab. And they called that the miracle tab. Over on this side of the keyboard, you'll see uh, one, two, and three. This is your tension control for, or your or your touch control for the machine, um, and it, you know, I, it's marginal at best in terms of the difference it makes with regards to the pressure required to depress the keys. But, you know, it was a selling feature of the Remington. Uh, and then it has anything else that you would find actually on a big typewriter. So uh, here, let me, let's come back and look at some of the, the basics. So here we have the um, up here, this button, there's one on each side, is your carriage release. This 
is your paper release. So to take the tension off the paper, to adjust it or to pull it out um, uh, and off the platen, you would just flip that up. And so that's where those controls are. You also had a, a platen release here. This chrome, you'll notice there's not one on the right side of the machine. It's just solid green uh, platen turn knob. But on here, we have a chrome button where if you depress and um, depress and turn, it just releases. I'm trying to do this with one hand. It's not really working. But if you depress and turn, it just releases the platen. Um, so, there you go. There is the machine. So what I'm going to do now, uh, that we've kind of taken a little tour of the machine, I'm going to put a piece of paper in it, and we'll do a little typing on this Remington Quiet Writer from 1957. some paper in the machine, but uh, when we were taking our little tour, I was remiss in showing one other feature, and that is the line selector. Uh, so this typewriter uh, gives you the option of typing single, double, or triple spaced. And the selector is really in kind of a very inconvenient spot. Uh, not that you might change it all that often, but um, it is right here. And you'll see there's a, the metal uh, piece uh, that sort of acts as the selector with a um, hollow circle in the center that highlights one two or three depending on where you have it set and it's right under the return arm and that's that's where it is so you can you can type um, as you like uh, in terms of space so what I'm going to do now is let me come out a little bit and I will try to do a little typing so that you can see the font. Again, this is a Pica machine. Let me take the margin out. So, um, So the, looks like my ribbon's getting a little dried out here. Very dried out. I'm going to, um, let me advance this a little bit. Or, you know what, let me go this way. Let's see if I can get into a little part of the ribbon that maybe wasn't as exposed. And maybe it'll be a little darker. There we go. see it does it has a nice uh, very standard um, serifed 
pica font to it. And uh, again, mm, I think maybe the, um, you know, typewriters are one of those things that uh, it is sort of to each his own. And you know, what feels really nice to one user might not feel the same way to another user. Um, and I think uh, these tend to have a little bit of a squishy touch to them, uh, but, but that's just my interpretation. I think of the typers of this era, I probably like the Smith Corona um, 5 series, you know, uh, better, but um, this is certainly a good typewriter. So, thank you for hanging out with me, and I appreciate you spending a little time for this edition of Always Analog, and I think um, I'll try to do some more typewriters as we go along, um, since I have a variety to share. As much as I love reviewing pencils, um, I will uh, try to get some more typewriters in the mix. So please share, like, and subscribe if you enjoy what I do here on this channel, and I'll look forward to seeing you again real soon here on Always Analog.